Hello, welcome. Happy Sunday. Welcome to Talk Heathen. My name's Kenneth. With me today is a man who needs no introduction, so we're not going to give him one. Uh, Matt Dillahunty. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, man. How you doing, man? <laughs> I'm doing great. How are you? I'm I'm doing well. I'm really looking forward to getting into some calls. Um, we've got uh, we've got one guy on the line who I, I'm especially interested in at the outset here. Uh, I don't know if it's Jeff Jeffy. Um, maybe you can help me with that caller. Uh, it says you want to talk to us about how you, you can't shake uh, the fear of hell for your two daughters. Is that what you wanted to talk about? Hello? Jeffy? All right. Hey, how's it going? Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Awesome. Awesome. Yes. Um, so I understand you're having a hard time shaking the fear of hell. Yes. Um, if I may ask, if you could come back to me, I'm um, currently, I was in a busy place and I'm just leaving. So if you could I'll, come back. I'll me, drop you back in the queue. That. That's fine. That's fine. We'll drop you back in the queue. We'll, we'll take on someone else here. Um, I'll tell you what, let's, uh, let's go with James in, uh, in North Carolina. James, you, this says that you thought of a criteria that would prove God if it could be done. I, I'm intrigued. James, what, what what's going on? Um, hey, I'm uh, I'm really glad to be talking to you guys. Thanks for uh, taking my call. I didn't expect to uh, get we'll on. See how long that lasts. Um, uh, all right, all right. Um, so, to firstly, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, firstly, I'm an atheist, so I'm definitely not trying to. I'm not saying I have proof of God. The reason I'm calling is because. Um, a lot of people call in with proof for God, or they ask you what you think would prove God, and the answer is usually, I don't know, and it's really, really hard to, to figure out a way to know. And I um, I thought of a criteria, at least one that would um, more or less work for me, so I just wanted to run it by you guys to see what you think. If it's yeah, full drop, of it on, drop it on the table, so. man. Let's see, let's see what, what you're working with. All right, so I've... Um, Determined for me at least um, one good way for, for God to show himself is I, I've determined I need three things, all, all three things or else it doesn't work. Um, the first thing is that I would need to actually have a conversation with God. So, and that's while I'm lucid. So like not in a dream, not while I'm drunk, not while I'm depressed or anything like that. It has to be an actual conversation. No, um, like magic eight ball bible stuff he has to actually talk to me himself um i, I got okay so, uh, I, I got let me let me interject really quick i know you're laying out all three here but i i just want to say okay. at the outset my first response is going how could you possibly know if the experience that you're having is in fact talking to a god um i mean there, there are plenty of people who while thinking of themselves as being in a completely lucid state have experiences that they attribute to all different kinds of gods to i mean i've talked to people who say they've been abducted by aliens people who believe they're they're communicating with the dead um and they would all say they were perfectly lucid at the time so with the first thing that you put on the table i'm already going well how how would you go about determining that that you were actually even having that experience um, well, a lot of it is I would need, um, that, that's why I said I would need kind of all three things together. The first thing, the reason I mentioned that is because like in order for me to take it with any sort of significance, it would have to be while I'm lucid is, is basically what I was saying. So in order for me to actually think of it as something special and not just, oh, I'm drunk or oh, I'm dreaming, it would have to, you know, I'd have to be in that state of mind is what I was trying to establish there. I, okay. I want to get to your other two criteria, definitely, but I also don't know how you can know that you're lucid. Yeah, uh, a guy. I, that, I, have, um, I have no idea how a pot. So, if I were to begin listing criteria, having a conversation with God, um, apart from the fact that you're you're talking about a being who might be um, capable of demonstrating to you that you are in a conversation with God, okay. What what are the other two? Um, yeah. So the the other thing is I would need, um, you know, basically confirmation that I experienced what I experienced. So I would need other people um, who also had the exact same experience, saw the exact same thing I saw, heard the same voice saying roughly the same things, as close to exact as possible. That way I, you know, I wouldn't write it off as just a, a one-off mental trip that, that I had that was unique to my mind. So I need um, 
some so sort of confirmation outside. Independent of confirmation, it. yes. Okay. What's the third one? Yep. Um, the third one, um, and probably the biggest one, is I would need something outside of that experience that would actually prove that it was God or at least something powerful. So I'd need something um, unexplainable by science. So it would need to give me like an apple that regenerates itself when you bite into it or a snowball that never melts. You know, something that I could have um, – Something I could have outside of that experience to confirm it, maybe something that I could give to, say, scientists to have them study to, you know, get. Um, Unexplainable is a word that, that always throws me because I don't know how we we could ever really make the jump from unexplained to unexplainable. You know what I mean? I mean when we're talking about the realm of, of science, we're talking about things that we can test and, and, and demonstrate to be true and repeat and all these things. I mean, there's a lot of stuff over, you know, throughout history that, that people have thought of as unexplainable, but science just wasn't there yet. And now we have explanations for those things. Um, so I, yeah, there's, there's a lot of little things <laughs> with what you're saying where I'm going, okay. Um, but I just don't, I don't, I don't know how we could get to where you're talking about needing to, to be. Um, and independently of all of that, what you're talking about seems to be leading toward ways that you could be convinced that you had an experience then, then attributing that to a, to a God or something supernatural. But I don't know how that would, you know, prove it to other people, uh, either, you know, there'd yeah, be I, further I have, steps. I have mountains of problems, not the least of which is that we didn't begin by actually start, start by defining a God. But if we take your, your criteria, your three pronged thing, uh, one of them is a conversation with God, um, which that alone could prove it, provided that it's actually a God who could then provide the demonstrations. Number two is confirmation from others that this, that they experienced and saw the same thing. And the third one is that you need some, you, and literally you said need something outside of that that would prove. Well, that's the whole ball game. If you can't tell me exactly what it is that would actually prove it, then all you're saying is you're building up step one, step two, and then the proof. But here's the thing. If you were in the late 19th, early 20th century and you went to a seance, uh, you would have been in conversation with something that purported to be a spirit. Other people outside of you would have been sitting at the same table or in the same room, and they would confirm that, yes, that conversation experience happened. And they would have been able to produce a phenomenon that you would not have been able to explain, including ectoplasm and stuff. So your own criteria would have had you believing that you were talking to spirits when you absolutely were not. I don't see how yeah. your criteria gets you anywhere near demonstrating that a, a God exists or that you've interacted with a God. And yeah, Matt's got me thinking about the whole uh, Arthur Conan Doyle and the Doyle's fallacy thing. <laughs> Cause I mean, there's plenty of people who are otherwise intelligent people who get taken in by you know, falsehoods. Um, they, they, they make the leap to believing stuff without having sufficient evidence to justify that because they, they make this mistake of thinking, well, I've already eliminated all of the explanations that are out there. So it must be this other thing, but that's, that's a, that's a mistake. That's, that's a, a trap cognitively. Hey, and that, that makes a lot of, a lot of sense. Um, I guess part of it is I, I, I didn't really define God before I, I started, I guess my, my definition for God would be, um, I suppose, a, a being that is capable of mass creation, I guess, you know, able to create planets, life, whatever, um, by itself. But I don't necessarily think it would be, you know, all powerful or all knowing. I don't really see how. So the problem, James, is. So, so now you're in a position where you're defining God, but. You're, so you're now claiming what it is that you're seeking to find. But what if God isn't the way you define? What if there's a God that does not match your definition? You have, it's like saying, I'm going to go look for um, a, a missing particle that explains everything. And I'm going to define that particle with properties A, B, C, and D. And whoops, we didn't find it. But what if your definition is incorrect? So this is why when people call into the shows and why I have debates and discussions, they say, oh, what's your, what's your definition of God, Matt? I don't have one. I have many. 
I have as many definitions of God as there are people who have pro proposed them. What I want to know is for the person who says that a God exists, they are the ones who get to declare the definition of God. And then based on that definition, we can then begin to examine whether or not they are, are offering up a definition of a God that is consistent with reality or not. It does mean like I could define God as a as a uh, a married bachelor. Ta-da! I just demonstrated there can't be any gods ever. Woo! So my definition of God doesn't matter. I have to deal with the God that is being defined by the person I'm talking to. And if you're if you don't believe in a God, then all you can do is say, okay, I'm going to go look for maybe this person's definition, this person's definition, and I'd just rather they do the work. So yeah. I don't think you've got good criteria for determining whether or not a God exists. And honestly, not to you know bag on you, James, but it doesn't matter what your definition of God is. And the second you define you as an atheist say this is the God I'm looking for, then any theist out there could say, oh, well, there's your problem. You went and defined right. God wrong. Yeah. Uh, okay. and and you're playing the exact same game that a lot of them are playing. Uh, the, the theists that are out there, they'll say, okay, I define God as this set of things. So if I have an experience that fits my idea of what that entity could provide me, and I don't have any other explanation for it, and other people have experiences that they attribute to the same thing, well, voila, we've proven God. But yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't really work that way. Yeah, no, that, that makes perfect sense. I think kind of um, part of the, the reason I kind of leaned into that that flaw is because I, I used to be a Christian, so the only God that I have any kind of reference point for, I guess, would be Yahweh. And I'm trying to, the, the thing with, with uh, me saying, you know, the whole criteria for proving God is I'm open if these things ever were to happen. You know, I, I wouldn't assume the, the type of God it is. I can't say for sure all these things happened and, oh, it's Yahweh or, oh, it's Allah or, oh, it's Vishnu, but it would definitely if it were to happen to me in that way, I think it would make me strongly consider the, the possibility a bit more. Cause right now I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I'm convinced that there is no God, but I'm leaning more towards, I, I, I think the odds are stronger that there isn't a God than that there is. Well, I, 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 I think that you might be making a very common mistake. Um, I had an interaction uh, about a year and a half ago with a guy who asked me uh, what would happen to me if I had like a, a Damascus road type of experience where like I had a vision and, and it's like God appeared to me. What would I do? And I said, I'd get an MRI like immediately and I'd go talk to mental health professionals. And this guy freaked out. He was like, I can't believe you're being that skeptical. Wouldn't you, you know, because from his perspective, he's going, well, I can confidently attribute experience to cause without having to do any of the work of actually connecting those things with any sort of evidence. Um, we're all so desperate. I should say most of us are so desperate to, to feel like we've got explanations for things when we don't. So it, it, it seems to me that, that what you may be doing uh, is leaning into that going, okay, well, if I have a set of experiences, then I can attribute it to this thing and have an answer. Um, but I think that that's a mistake. I think the time to believe stuff is when you've got, evidence linking the you know the effect to the cause um and anything beyond that is is i think a, a trap it's it's a way to because we're as you know human beings we want to see patterns we want to feel like we we know what's going on um we're we're very very quick to jump to conclusions about things and it's just a really good way to be wrong about stuff one of the things is that when you started you know after we got to some clarification and let's define things if you say, oh, I was uh, a Christian, so I can only talk about Yahweh. Well, uh, how many different versions and ideas and concepts of Yahweh are there? I mean, I was a Southern Baptist. I had friends who were Presbyterians, Methodists, Catholics, and none of us had exactly the same notion about God. Now, there is, I will grant you, um, within philosophy, this God of classical theism that is at least maximally powerful, and et cetera. And you'd probably be okay kind of assuming or, or saying, hey, I'm going to talk about the God of classical theism because if we could demonstrate that that God existed, that would be a good pointer towards further clarifying which God exists. And if we show that somehow the God of the classical theism doesn't exist or can't exist, well, that means we've eliminated all God concepts that are derived from that. So anything that would include that, like... If you, if you just picked one characteristic, like 
all powerful, having all power that could be. If you could show that that wasn't true, then every God that includes all powerful as a characteristic with that same definition of all powerful clearly also isn't real. Um, but yeah, even just trying to go, oh, we're talking about Yahweh. Well, who the hell's <laughs> Yahweh? Which yeah. which Yahweh are you talking about? The one my grandmother believed in, the one I believed in, the one the people at the Pentecostal church down the road believed in? It's not easy. And that's why we. It's I just avoid it and say, hey, Tell me what you believe and why. Um, yeah. I hope that that helped a little bit, uh, James. Uh, speaking of what people believe and why, we're going to move on to some theist callers. But uh, have right, a great I, rest I of your Sunday. You. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate Thanks. you guys talking to them. You gave me a lot to think about. Thanks for the call. All right. Before we move on to those those theists uh, who are starting to stack up in the queue and we want more of them. Also, listen, I, I've been doing this more and more. Um, theists, if you're watching this, uh, encourage your pastor to call in. Um, I am dying to talk to a pastor. Um, it, listen, it, it, it's like 1.15 central time right now. Church is out. You guys are just hanging out. So so <laughs> please t tell your tell your clergy to call in. I, I'm just dying to talk to one. Um, put it put us on the big screen at your after church social dinner. <laughs> yeah. and have your pastor call in and completely clean our clocks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we we could use some some clarity. Um, so yeah, I want to get a couple of these announcements out of the way before we take the next caller. So Talk Heathen, for those who don't know, is a product of the ACA, which is a 501c3 organization. Uh, here we're dedicated to the promotion of positive atheism and the separation of religion and government. Um, if you would like to support Talk Heathen and the frankly essential work that the ACA does, uh, you can become a member by clicking the join button below the video. Uh, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash talk heathen to me. Um, we also have a channel that houses all of the ACA shows in just an audio podcast form. Uh, you can see that at tiny.cc slash AEN podcast. That's actually, that's how I listen to all my ACA stuff on Mondays. I just plug into the podcast feed and listen to everybody. Um, you can become part of the Talk Heathen community as well in our fan run Facebook page, which is uh, at facebook.com slash groups slash Talk Heathen FG. That is a great place to get plugged in. We're always talking about how this is a community. If you want to get really involved, that's a great place to do it. Um, if you would like to continue talking after the show, you can join. I'll be in the ACD, our fan run Discord server at tiny.cc slash ACA Discord. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about some of the other ACA stuff here after talking to some, some theists. Um, yeah, yeah. uh, let's dive in. We got Samuel who, this is interesting. You want to talk about how you disagree with church's use of appealing to authority. Is that, is that right, Samuel? That's correct. Okay. Um, this strikes me as an interesting place to start as a, as a theist. Um, what, okay. I, I'll just, I'll just bite. What, what is it? Yeah. What is it that you disagree with, with the church's use of appealing to authority? Do you mean authority? Like, like, okay, so, so, um, like I'll give you an example. Like, um, so I'm pretty sure you've heard of the popular apologist, William Lane Craig. I have heard of William. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm familiar with Dr. Craig. And, often, and oftentimes what I'll see churches or what certain pastors will do they'll take what a certain apologist says and they'll and they'll treat what that apologist says as gospel like what that apologist says is absolutely factually correct and sure. will just dismiss any skeptic as just being overly skeptical i i've seen issue with that i yeah i've seen people do that i think that's a problem i would say i think it's a problem taking the gospel as gospel um i think that there's <laughs> sort of like a, a layer cake here of you know, I, I would just say that appeal to authority is a fallacy. Yeah. So of course I take issue with it. Yeah, we're we're in total agreement thus far that uh, appeals to authority are a problem. Something it something okay. should never be considered true because a particular person says so. Yeah. Yeah, well, to me, I do recognize that that's a fundamental flaw or fallacy, you could say. And I'll probably say almost all religions, but I mean, like, I don't have any problem with gay people, but I'm aware that a lot of people who are Christians, including people that I know do, 
And sometimes I take issue with that because, like, they go overboard, which to me, they're bigotry sometimes, which is why I call it out at times. So, which is why I do disagree with this authority mm. aspect where all gay people are evil because the Bible says so or something. Sure. Well, I mean, you're, you're pointing to sort of the larger problem that I was thinking about when I saw what you wanted to talk about, um, because there's a fallacious appeal to authority, and which is when you're appealing to a false authority, and then there's there's appeals to authority that are not fallacious. Um, and it's a, it's a fine line that we, we walk with this. If, if I'm pointing to say the, the people who are experts in their field doing research at the CDC, telling people they should get vaccinated because all of the available evidence points to get vaccinated. Um, if I go, Hey, listen, the experts are saying this is a good idea. That is not a fallacious appeal to authority. But if someone says, you know, well, Jesus says that, I don't know, whatever, then the question is, well, well, why should we care what Jesus says? Do you see that distinction? Well, actually, I, I mean, I do agree. Well, I do agree, for example, I mean, Jesus, I mean, uh, well, many of the things that are attributed to Jesus, most of them are just claims. I mean, I admit that. I mean, I've listened to Matt numerous times say that most of those are just claims, which I agree. I mean, I have no way to actually demonstrate Jesus said anything. And I think that any theist who wants to call in and say that they have evidence that Jesus says anything needs to demonstrate that. Because all we, for, for the most part, we just have claims. And pastors don't really present evidence. They just preach what the Bible says and expects you to just to believe it or take it for what they're saying. I mean, I don't, which is why I've always done arguments with like family members or friends or even church members because of this issue. I says, I don't care what your pastor is stating. I need to know demonstrably if what he's saying is true. And sometimes people take issue with that. Well, that's the whole issue is what, make, what makes something an authority or, or legit, legitimately authoritative. Um, when people talk about, well, scripture says X, the first question needs to be, well, why should anyone give a shit what scripture says about anything? Um, so I think you're, you're tugging on all the right strings here with how you're thinking about stuff. The, now I, so the, the call screen thing says that you're a theist. Uh, so I got to ask what, what flavor of, of theism do you, you know, believe in? Well, when it comes to the, the actual concept of God, um, I honestly don't even know. Like, when, when I say that I'm a theist, I would say that I'm just a theist that's still questioning. Like, I, I probably may become an atheist at some point in the future because I actually am leaning more towards that way just because of, you know, when I look at the claims for different religions, as Matt stated, they haven't met their burden of proof. I mean, I agree. No one has come forward and said, I've demonstrated that Jesus exists and that he's the son of God and that we should all worship him. I mean, I agree that nobody has actually demonstrated that. No one's demonstrated that Allah exists, despite what Muslims claim. You know, we don't know if Vishnu exists. I mean, Vishnu may exist. But even if he does, we can't say concretely that he does until he demonstrates himself to everybody. So, I mean, I agree with Matt on all of that, which is why, I'm, which is probably why I'm, I'm questioning a lot and probably might become an atheist in the future. But when it comes to the actual concept of God, I think that a lot of people are, are very condensed when it comes to their idea of God. So either a God is a monster or he's caring or maybe he's indifferent. And I mean, he may be, he, he might be indifferent. He might care. He might be loving. You know, he might be a monster as Matt stated. That's possible. I mean, that's another reason why I disagree with Christianity, this concept of an eternally burning hell. Well, I mean, I think yeah. everybody on some level knows that that's immoral. Without, without getting too much further into the weeds, I, I'm, I just, I'm going to ask you point blank. Are you convinced that the proposition God exists is true? I mean, like, at, I mean, we're talking at, at bottom. Are you convinced that there's a God? Um, I'm going to say no. Okay. <laughs> if I was to say, Welcome to atheism. Was, okay. Yes, I'm 100% sure. I would be lying because, and I'm going to be honest, when it comes to a lot of other theists, now, of course, I can't speak for all theists, but I think on some level, a lot of theists who call in, this is why they get angry at Matt or they'll say, well, you know, Matt needs to demonstrate that there is no God or et cetera. It's because they know themselves that they actually have no evidence. Because if they did, whether Matt likes God or not is irrelevant. Just demonstrate that he exists or not. And yeah, I noticed, I, I've seen this from different theist callers who'd be calling in. I, I also need to clear up some stuff about the fallacious appeals from authority because the way it was portrayed isn't necessarily accurate. So there, the, the fallacy that we identify as appeal to authority is when someone says something is true because a particular authority says so. That is the fallacy. It has nothing to do with whether or not that person's a real authority. 
If you say, if Neil deGrasse Tyson tells you something about cosmology and you say, it's true, I know because Neil deGrasse Tyson told me that is a fallacious appeal to authority. Doesn't matter whether it's whether he was right or anything else. If you say it's true because Neil deGrasse Tyson said so, that is a fallacy. If the fallacious appeal to authority is that that is you saying it's true because an authority said so. It is not a fallacy to cite an authority to say, ah, I believe this. I'm convinced of this. And I heard Neil deGrasse Tyson say this because it's not the fact that Neil said it. It is the evidence that he's pointing to. Citing the actual evidence is what we're, we're pointing there. When, when a biologist talks about the facts of biology, we don't take their word for it just because they have a degree in biology. It doesn't become true just because of, of their uh, credentials or knowledge. It becomes true because of the evidence. There's a separate fallacy that is the fallacious appeal to an insufficient authority, which is like when you say nine out of 10 dentists say that the Cubs are the best team in the in the in the <laughs> league um there's nothing about a dentist that would make them an expert in this field so no, there's nothing that, yeah, wrong right. with citing an expert provided that what we're pointing to is the data and evidence that the expert is presenting but two different fallacies fallacious appeal to authority it's true because an authority said so no way fallacious appeal to an insufficient authority ah nine out of ten dentists say the cubs rock yeah, and that's absolutely right. What I was, I'm trying to point to, and I, I should have explained this better, is what makes the claim that the authority is making actually authoritative. And what, and what Matt's right. absolutely right. It's, it is about the evidence, not about who's saying it. Yeah. But anyway, thanks, Samuel. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I keep searching. Yeah. Well, I was good. Yeah, I was also just going to add, you know, as a final point here that, you know, I agree that the Bible does. Yes, it does. I, you know, a lot of these will disagree with me. The Bible does endorse slavery. I mean, when it comes to women's issues, you know, that's questionable on women's issues. We already know how the Bible talks about gay people, you know. It shits on gay people. We already know that. I mean, you know, there's various issues that we all... That I would probably agree with Matt on pretty much, like, when it comes to gay issues, I mean, yes, the Bible got that wrong. They just might be upset at this, but yes, gay people are not pedophiles. They're not wicked, as the Bible would try to paint them out to be, you know? So, and, you sure. know, and the fact that they should go to hell and burn forever, which some Christians will claim that they do, you know, is immoral. The fact that God gave commands to kill children and babies and everything else in the Old Testament is immoral. And Christians <laughs> know this too, which is why if I was to kill a baby, yeah. it would be like, you're an asshole that deserves to go to jail. Samuel, we got to move on, but I appreciate you stirring the hornet's nest with all the theists uh, before before taking off. Have a great rest of your week, man. Some might be mad at me for saying all these things. No, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. We just got to move on to some other callers. Have a good one. Um, all right. <laughs> One more thing. Hey, there's all this shit in the Bible that I, you know, completely disagree with. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, we've got some theists. Where are we at? Here we go. I This guy se it seems like he's coming in real confident. We've got David in California. David says he has definite proof of God and problems with the view of atheists. David, thanks for calling in to straighten us out. How are you doing? I'm doing good, Kenneth and Matt. How are you doing? Great. Let's hear that definite proof of God. Well, I do have definite proof of God, and I've spoken to both of you before and have never been able to give this proof. So give it. <laughs> the problem I'm having, yeah, you know, the problem I'm having is that you guys claim, well, you make appeal to authority. I'm glad that Nathaniel brought that up, that somehow I am not qualified to give any evidence of God. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you give the proof uh, instead of whining about the last time? Yeah, the other the other stuff. Just give the proof, man. Okay, as long as you guys don't say I'm not qualified, I'm good. Well, so, I mean, listen, proof is proof. Just just give the proof. Okay, so right. <coughs> excuse me. So I have no degrees in science. Okay, so. According to some people, I'm not qualified to give any. Could you just I, get, we don't care. <laughs> you get, just get to the argument? Yeah. Stop whining about the past and preambling about all kinds of stuff. Just get to the argument. If you have definitive proof for God, there should be absolutely nothing we'll be able to say about it. So yeah. just give it. I don't have a degree in science either. It, do, it doesn't matter. Okay, well, no, I, if you guys would... Just let me speak. Okay. The Holy shit. We've <laughs> asked you to speak two times already. Stop with the preamble. Stop yeah. with the whining. Get with the proof or go away. Yeah, just give it, man. 
Okay, I'm just... I don't know if people are going to understand it. That's stop all. Stop with right, the you, preamble. When I, it, stop yeah. talk, when I stop talking, David, start with your proof. One more interruption about, I don't know this, and people will think this, and what about this? Just go with the damn proof now. Okay. The cosmology of David gives the definitive proof by the claim and the Big Bang Theory by the claim of expansion of the cosmos. Okay. That is the definitive proof of matter or uh, the cosmos expanding into an invisible realm. Okay, so just to make sure that I'm following you, what you've said so far is that the expansion of matter is proof of God? Or of space, okay? So space is a claim by science, okay? I, no, I'm not the only one making this claim. But the Bible and science both claim that there was an expansion of space because God had to make room for the stars. And so that expansion into an invisible realm, we know it's an invisible realm because the CMBR is an equal measurement across the entire cosmos. And that proves that there's no expansion currently happening because it's equal. Okay, let me let me ask you a question. So if if science is saying that there's an expansion of, of matter in space and the Bible makes some reference to the expansion of matter or space, how do we link those two things together? Could the Bible be wrong be, be onto something by accident? Could the Bible be referring to something else? Could, I mean, how do we make that link? How do we go this is some sort of evidence of, of something. Okay, I'm, I'm referring to the, in the Bible, you know, when God created the earth and the water, the seas, and there was no atmosphere, okay, then he had to make an atmosphere and a heavens. He had to make the heavens in order to cast the stars into the sky, okay? okay. So he had to make an expansion and... David, I don't think you understood my question. So if it, let's say hypothetically that the Bible said that DNA is a, like a double helix structure. OK, um, it doesn't. There's nothing remotely that that clear in, in the Bible related to anything scientific. Um, but let's say it did. Let's say the Bible accurately described the structure of DNA. How would we how would we go from there to that is evidence for God? Well, I'm, I'm not trying to discuss DNA as evidence for God. I'm trying to claim the expansion of space as the evidence for God. So I don't want to get diverted down that road. I'm claiming okay. the, the expansion of space into a realm that didn't exist. I mean, because if you say expansion, Kenneth, right, you were saying that something got bigger. Okay, so if, if the Bible says space got bigger and... Science is is indicating that space got bigger and these two things seem to line up with each other. How do we go from there to saying these things seem to be in agreement with each other to proof of God? Because also, can, can you give us a verse that talks about the expansion just for reference? Okay. All right, Matt. In uh, the first three days of creation, God said, let there be light. I asked for a verse. Okay. Yeah. I asked for a verse. I don't I don't have the precise verse. It's in chapter one. Why did you call with proof of God citing cosmology in the Bible and you don't even have verses ready to go to talk about the expansion? If you say the Bible talks about expansion, at a minimum you should be able to pull up like something from Isaiah 40. But we got stretching out the heavens and all that. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm only going by Genesis one, and you guys are aware of Genesis. Genesis one does not does not have the word expansion in it, but it does say, "Let there be light." Okay, and in order for David, David, you said the Bible talks about expansion. You say you're only using Genesis one. I say that Genesis one doesn't include the word expansion and your response is to say, it does say, let there be light. Well, let there be light is not expansion. If you can't put together an argument that, that is, that is coherent, what are, what are we doing? What are we doing? Yeah. I mean, uh, other people, there are other, there are, wait a minute, David, there are other people who could have called in 
to talk about the Bible talking about expansion. I already gave you one reference in Isaiah 40. There's another one in Isaiah 42. And these metaphorical language about God spreading out the heavens is there, and it is interpreted by some as predicting the expansion. The problem is, even if you had cited those verses, that wouldn't prove either that a God did expand. It would not prove that anybody knew about an expansion. And it doesn't demonstrate that what the Bible's talking about is consistent with what we find within the cosmology as we understand it in science. But you're doing worse than that because you're saying, I'm only gonna point to this book of the Bible, which doesn't talk about expansion, and I'm gonna pretend that it does. And that doesn't interest me because that's not a good argument or an honest one. Well, first off, Matt, I never claimed I was gonna prove the Bible. I just said I was gonna prove a heaven <laughs> and a creator. But you're referencing the Bible as part of your, your proof, man. I, I didn't ask you to, pr David, I, David, I didn't ask you to prove the Bible. I asked you to make the art to defend the argument that you're making. And you're saying that the Bible talks about expansion and that this proves that there's a God. Well, you're absolutely wrong. The Bible can talk about a million things, including that there are beasts of the field. And then you could go point at the beasts of the field and say, look, the Bible's right. Yes, the Bible's right. There are beasts of the field, but that doesn't prove a God. And yeah. when you say that the Bible talks about expansion, and then when I ask you for a verse, you say, it says, let there be light. I no longer think that you are, are, are actually serious because nothing about this is a coherent argument at all. Yeah, because like, whether whether or not you understand cosmology or not, it, it, it's sort of irrelevant. I mean, what you're doing would be like if if a detective uh, saw uh, like there was a suspect drove away from a crime scene in a blue Honda and I have a blue Honda. Therefore, I'm the the criminal who did the thing. It's well, worse. How... It's worse yeah. because what you're doing is saying a suspect drove away in a blue Honda and I found a guy in a red Honda. I think somebody's being dishonest about wanting evidence because you won't let me give it. Well, okay. So evidence necessarily is, is something that can be used to demonstrate that a claim is true. What we're asking you is how to, how to do that. How, how is, how is what you're presenting? How could it possibly be used to demonstrate that the claim a God exists is true? Where's the link? Okay. Let's forget all about the Bible. Let's go with the big bang theory. It claims expansion, right? Okay. Okay, this is science. Okay, I'm not one that appeals to authority because I'm not an authority, but uh, I'm pretty Jesus sure. Christ, you don't I, even after explaining appeals to authority, you get it wrong again. Matt, I'm just trying to give you evidence. No, you're not. No, no you're not, David. You're trying to waste my time. I'm going to stop talking. Yeah. I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to stop talking. And then I want you to actually give a, a single piece of evidence and and explain how it demonstrates there's a God. Can you do that or not? Yes, I'm trying to do that, Matt. Thank you. You're not trying to do that. When I stop talking, do it. I'm done talking. Okay. The Big Bang claims expansion. Okay. Expansion means something gets bigger. And if something gets bigger, that means that space is being created. And if space is being created into other areas that are not physical, that means that is an invisible realm into which the cosmos is now expanding. And if that is an invisible realm, okay, it's not physical. It's not subject to any metaphysics or laws of physics. It is an invisible supernatural realm where space is created. And if space is created in that invisible realm, then that means that something is happening that is counter to science and physics, that something is being created out of nothing in an invisible realm that is not subject to physics. And that means there's, since there's creation in an invisible realm that is not subject to physics, that there is also a creator because inanimate matter or space cannot be created by itself. The cosmos no, is not pantheist. You're done, David. It cannot create itself. David, listen to me. I, I took notes and I jotted down your entire argument. So first of all, Big Bang cosmology. That's not my entire argument. Hang on, I'm muting you, David. Oh, you oh got, trust you me, listen. your argument's fucking done. Now shut up and listen. Yeah, you're, you're, you're muted, so, so just, just listen, David. Big Bang cosmology is the current best explanation we have for the origin of the universe. And when it talks about space expanding, we have no idea what, if anything, it's expanding into. An infinite, endless nothing. 
you have taken that and, and, and made it a conclusion that space is being created. That's not what Big Bang Cosmology says. It doesn't say that space is being created. It says that space is expanding. Things are getting further and further apart, et cetera. But you're saying you are declaring that space is expanding into areas that are not physical. You don't know that. You don't have any way to demonstrate. You then call it an invisible realm. You don't know that. You don't have any way to, to demonstrate it. You then say it's not a physical realm. You don't know that. You don't have any way to demonstrate it. And then you say that space is being created. That's not necessarily true. And then you say that if something is creating space, there must be a creator. But even if all of that were true, right up to that last line that says there must be a creator, what we're talking about is there must be some explanation for the expansion of the universe. And even if there were space being air quotes created, that doesn't mean that there is a God doing the creation. You haven't demonstrated that there's anything other than naturalistic uh, explanations for this. So we've taken the foundations of science and you have turned that on its head and argued for things that no scientist would advocate for, no cosmologist would agree on. You are just saying, hey, if the universe is getting bigger, it must be expanding into something. And that means there must be a God who is making space for the universe to expand into. However, that's not a sound argument. You have not demonstrated any evidence for it. You have fallaciously concluded that because you and scientists do not have an explanation for the expansion, therefore, argument from ignorance, there must be a God doing it. Your argument is flawed at every conceivable level. It is fractally wrong. Yeah. And, and this is an amazing opportunity because I, I muted you so you could just really listen. So I'm going to unmute you and we're going to run a, a, a test here. If, if you were listening and are able to respond to what Matt was saying, then we're having something called a conversation. If not, then we're going to drop it and move on to other callers. So I'm going to unmute you right now. Hello. Hi, David. <laughs> were you listening to Matt? Yeah. Okay. What's your response? Demonstra it's demonstrably false, everything Matt said. Okay. Goodbye. All right. See you, David. All right. David, like, I I don't know how it could possibly be made any clearer. You're, you're running up to where you're, you're in the land of make-believe when you start talking about the physical properties outside the universe. You, 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 you don't know what you're talking about. Um, and it's okay to not know what's going on outside the universe. Nobody does. What's not okay is to just start making shit up and asserting stuff that you can't possibly yeah. demonstrate. That's, um, that's a, uh, Kenneth just made probably the key point in this. You know, I can point out that, you know, we've got an argument from ignorance here, but we don't know and we are prohibited through through the just the physical facts of the universe from exploring what happened before the Big Bang, or even if that concept makes sense because time evidently began with it. And we don't have any way to reach outside of our universe to say, ah, here's what we're expanding into. Maybe we're not expanding into anything. Maybe it is. I know that does not make sense, but when you start talking about matter can't be created or destroyed, when you start talking about those laws of thermodynamics, David, what, what you should be saying is matter cannot be created or destroyed within the current universe. That does not necessarily apply outside of it. Our laws of thermodynamics, our laws of physics are descriptive and they are describing the universe that we inhabit. They, it, would, it is a mistake absolutely, unequivocally, every time to try to apply those laws to outside of the universe. We have not discovered a universal thing that applies outside of the universe. And we also have no way of knowing if outside of the universe makes any more sense than before. Yes. Yep. Gosh. Well, hey, listen, uh, if you're loving what you're seeing here, if you're watching, um, make sure to check out our other shows that are happening today. After this, we're going to have uh, the ACA show, The Nonprofits, which uh, is going to be at 3 p.m. Central at YouTube.com slash The Nonprofits ACA. And after that, you know, Matt's going to be on on AXP with uh, with Phil, right? It's you and yeah, me and Phil Ferguson. Phil Ferguson. So be sure to check that one out as well. Um, also, we got a clip. The ACA has a clip to show you for stuff that you may have missed. In the oh, last this week. would be good. Yeah, roll clip. <laughs>
and and try to have some fun and sort it out with towels when you're all done. It's <laughs> always a good idea to bring a towel. <laughs> always bring a towel. I, I, why, hello, Dan, nice to see you. you oh, me? hi, Derek, thanks for being on the show. Uh, yes, uh, it's really great to be here. Oh, yeah, um, I'm really glad you're here, Derek. June 2020, uh, the Prince of Wales and the Are head you sure of that's the right year, Malty. That was okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't break, Malty. Okay. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. If okay. you can, if you can, if you can uh, demonstrate to us that the proposition "Jesus loves you" is true, I'll say it all day long. Easy as that. You're on with uh, me and Seth. Oh, you said uh, Seth. Yeah, Seth Andrews. Okay, I don't think I know him, but I just want to make sure I got his name correct. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's too good. <laughs> that, <laughs> that was so. Yeah, I don't know who the fuck that guy is, but okay, sure. Yeah, that's <laughs> fantastic. It's, um, it's funny because I, I granted, I've I've d- I've done atheist experience for sixteen years. I'm on lots of shows. I'm happy. It, it, I, I love being over here to hang out with you guys on Talk Heath and everything. But it annoys me when I have, especially if I have a special guest on, and somebody calls in and they're like, "I just want to talk to Matt." I don't know who that other person is. I'm not going to acknowledge them. It annoys me, especially uh, when they when they don't acknowledge like regular co-hosts and stuff. I am not the whole damn show. I am not Rob Van Dam. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's their show. They get to dictate That's who they're going to talk to, right? That's the, you know, I've I, there's been a few of the good ones over the years of that. of someone being like, well, this call, I'm just talking to Matt only. Oh, no, you're not. See ya. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. We should hang up on anybody who... Now, if somebody actually wants to address me and something I've said specifically... Um, sure. I mean, that's, that's fine, but right. You know, Oh, I only want to talk to Matt or actually somebody called one day on atheist experiences. Like I only want to talk to the co-host. I don't want to talk to Matt at all. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Go for it. It's like, who, who do you think you are? This isn't, this is not your show. Um, we got a couple atheists on the line. Uh, one's got an interesting question. Uh, I'm not saying the others are, have uninteresting questions. If you're listening right now, <laughs> but, um, we've got, uh, Lord, so we have a lot more talented hosts, right? <laughs> We got Lord here uh, in California. Looks like says uh, what to do with your old friends who are still Christians and wondering how to move forward with debating. Uh, thank you. I, you've been waiting on the line a long time. Um, how can we help? Yeah. Hey guys. Um, I watch the show all the time, and um, I've been waiting for like a question, like a good question to ask you guys. I find myself still in contact with many of my. Christian friends, because I went to Christian private school and all that stuff, and um, I went to college, and now I'm an atheist. So um, I, I find myself having the same kind of conversations with them, using arguments and trying to find logic and reason, um, and we always come back to, well, you can't prove there's not a God, so might as well believe, sort of thing. And I wonder, like, how to keep dealing with that. Well, I mean, there, there sounds like there's some confusion about where the burden of proof rests with people who are making claims about stuff. Well, yeah, and that's what I tell them, too, you know, because I understand all that. And it's frustrating for me, um, you know, trying to be friends with them or trying to, I guess, move on from being friends with them. And uh, we still have this, like, hill we need to climb. I get it. Like, they well, there's, don't want to meet me on the there's an There's an underlying issue. Uh, first, which is you need to decide how much it's worth to you to be having these conversations, because sometimes for the sake of salvaging a relationship, if, it, if, if, if the relationship is the first priority to you, then having conversations about, you know, deep philosophical stuff, questions about God and the universe and purpose, it, it, those can mess up a relationship uh, pretty quick uh, if you guys aren't seeing eye to eye. So you have to make the decision about, you know, whether you want to have those relationships. Um, I can tell you that there's been many relationships of mine where I've, I've really dug in with, you know, to talk to people about their, their God beliefs. Um, and in retrospect, I look at it and I go, I don't know if that was really necessary. You know, we're, our friendship could have been, you know, better if I hadn't done that. There's others where I look at it and I go, I'm absolutely glad I did that because the further we dug in on the God belief stuff, a bunch of stuff came bubbling up that let me know I didn't really want to be friends with this person anymore. So it's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different ways that can go. Um, so that's, that's number one. Number two, um, when it comes to this whole burden of proof thing, um, 
I don't know. I, my mind went to, to the whole Russell's teapot thing, um, finding analogies that you may be able to use for them to demonstrate the silliness of the, well, you can't prove it's not true position. Yeah. I, so okay. on this, yeah. on this thing where if they say, you know, you can't prove it's not true, so why not believe? Well, how many other things are they willing to believe merely because they haven't been proven false and which ones, for example, I would just respond with, okay, I'm God. You haven't proven that's false. You may not be able to prove it's false. And if you're going to be intellectually consistent, then if you're, as long as you're going to believe in a God, you better believe that I'm God. Yeah. You can pick up some worshipers pretty quick doing that. Okay. Get a nice little cult going. <laughs> but um, uh, we're not advocating for that. Yeah, uh, no, no. That's I, a disclaimer. <laughs> the, the point is to get them to say, ooh, I don't want to believe your God. Maybe I yeah. shouldn't run around believing things that aren't falsifiable or haven't been falsified. I see. I see. Because then, like, cause then I'm wondering, so why isn't, like, everyone's, well, I guess you could say everyone's default position is atheism. But, I, like, I wonder, like, where do where do all these, like, religions come from? You know, like, why don't they say, well, why do we why do we believe in God instead of, well, let's wait till we find a God and then believe it? That's it's cultural, man. I mean, the question of how did religions develop over time? I mean, that's that's more than we've got time for today. Um, but, yeah, it's. It's a cultural thing because everybody's default position is non-belief. Um, you know, with respect to all those other religions and all the other claims out there that they don't accept, it's it's I'm going to believe that when there's evidence. But people do a really good job of compartmentalizing and having this little subset of beliefs that they'll believe without any evidence for various, frankly, bad reasons. Um, so I, I wanted to touch on one thing because in the question here from the call screener, it said how to move forward with debating. And I just want to say that I don't think that debating should be your goal. I think that um, if if what you're looking to do is is change minds while maintaining positive relationships, I would look at stuff like what Anthony Magna Bosco does um, with street epistemology and just learning how to ask questions and just let the burden of proof rest with them. Ask them questions that are going to make them think about whether or not their beliefs are justified and see what happens. Um, because it, when you take a, a sort of a adversarial debating posture, uh, that that could be a pretty quick way to to f up your your friendships. And I'd also say that you know having yeah. having some examples. Uh, don't worry about the names of fallacies. Um, yeah, I did a little mini lecture earlier about appeals to authority, but it's not so much the names of the fallacies that matter. Ha have some things in your pocket so that when you recognize a particularly a specific fallacy instead of saying oh that's this you know you can say okay well then in order for you to be an intellectually consistent you must then therefore believe that i'm god yeah. or how many other things are you going to believe it, it can all be done by asking questions you know if somebody says oh well the bible says it's true oh well why should we accept the bible oh because it's the word of god how do you know it's the word of god oh because the bible says so and then now you get well that's kind of circular if i wrote down now a list of things yeah and i said you know yeah, uh, well, I, I would recommend looking up, um, Googling kissing Hank's ass. I I've read it before on the show. It's a great little thing and it's got 10 commandments in there. And it's a, it, it is a really excellent exercise in, in pointing out a number of different fallacies. Yeah. Okay. We'll take yeah. a look at that. Cool. Hopefully that helps. Yeah. Thanks guys. All right. Have a great rest of your day. Cool. Uh, before moving on, I, uh, I want to shout out our, our Patreon people, our top patrons. Uh, we got Eric Tweet. We've got CJ Dennis, Dingleberry Jackson, Balaam's Donkey. Actually, Matt, uh, last week with uh, with J. Mike, there was a question of, is it pronounced Balaam, Balaam? I've heard both. Do you have any insight on this? What the correct? Uh, I do not. <laughs> uh I don't have, I'm, I'm terrible at the pronunciation part. I can, I can read through it and I can research it different languages, but I have not looked up the pronunciation. I, uh, I'm, I'm reading the, uh, the atheist's handbook to the old Testament right now. I'm yeah. not listening to the audiobook that Seth did. Cause I don't need to be like aroused while listening to this Wood, book. You know? yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, as I'm reading this stuff, I'm going, I don't have a clue how to pronounce half of this shit, but you know, anyway, so, uh, we'll go with Balaam, Balaam's donkey. Uh, we got Paul Leah and an honorary mention to the great North American Dingaloo. Thank you very much for your continued support. We very much appreciate it. Um, it's what lets us do what we do.
Uh, let's see. Who do we have going on? We've got, oh, we've got a guy who has proof for the inexistence of God. I, I don't know how we're going to do that, but let's let's try it out here. Um, we've got Adam. Adam, you, you're saying you can prove the inexistence of God? That's correct, sir. Hi. Hi, guys. Hi. Yeah. Uh, which, which which God are you going to disapprove? Uh, the well, you you got me. <laughs> well, that was quick and easy. Next, is it really? In the in the call screen notes, it says a general deistic God. Yes. Yes. You're gonna you're gonna disprove the existence of a deistic there's God. There's a little bit delay. I, yeah, it, there, there's a bit of delay. I'm calling from the other side of the ocean. I understand. Please indulge me. Okay. Uh, okay. So I, I I will give you the uh, syllogistic representation. Okay. Listen, guys, this is actually just uh, an, an exercise in, uh, you know, constructing an argument, and I thought you guys would help me. Okay, to... let's, hear the, let's hear the syllogism. Let's Go see. for it. Oh, you, you're interested. Okay. So, the banca doink is the necessary attribute for any universe to be intelligible. That's premise one. Wait, wait. Say that again? Premise two. The banca doink, that's the name... Of the term, but it's a term I introduced. You're using? Are you? You're using it's just made like up a, a word? A placeholder made up thing called debunk a doink, yeah. and it's what? Thank you. Exactly. That is the necessary attribute for any universe to be intelligible, experienceable, or comprehensible. That's premise one. Okay. Let's, let's, it just says keep going. Keep going. There keep is going. An attribute for. Okay. Premise two. The universe is intelligible, comprehensible, uh, or uh, experienceable. Conclusion, okay. therefore, the bunker toink exists. Uh, and, okay, so... <laughs> okay. You got, okay, so there's a made-up placeholder word that is a, a necessary component yeah. for the intelligibility of any universe. Exactly. Premise two, Sorry. the universe is intelligible, therefore this necessary component exists. That's that's the argument? Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Okay. So first of all, if the conclusion isn't God doesn't exist, then you don't have an argument for the non-existence of a God. But also, your premise one is flawed in the sense that, yes, you have a made-up term that you describe as the necessary attribute for any universe to be experienceable. But you do not, you have to would have to demonstrate that there is an actual like a single attribute that on its own allows the universe to be experienceable because what it may be is that there may be a number of things that re are required for the universe to be experienced and yes you can put those all together so you could say debunk a doink is the collection of necessary attributes required for a universe to be experienceable and the universe are intelligible and the universe is intelligible. Therefore, debunk and the collection of things exist. But now you would have to go through and say, okay, what is, yeah, what, what what are is they? debunk and <laughs> What is that collection of things? And how do you know that that doesn't include a God? Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, actually, I thought about it. It's not just a placeholder. I, I do really have an idea about some sort. Uh, I can... Uh, it's it's a bit I don't know it's really conflicted by time. I, uh, I just want to say about regarding the uh, God uh, argument. The only the way this destroys the God argument because it uh, reduces the complexity of a God concept. Uh, I, it doesn't have any of the mind. Elements. No 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 no. Adam Adam. Okay. You cannot say that. Because as far as I can tell, debunk a doink requires a mind. Yes. One component of this is that it requires a mind, even a human mind, to be the experiencer, to make it intelligible. And I don't know what other characteristics are required to make something intelligible. And therefore, I cannot say that there isn't a characteristic 
called God or that equates to God that is required for the universe to be intelligible. We also can't assert that a God is necessary for the universe to be intelligible, but it would be a mistake to say, oh, we've listed out the criteria required for the universe to be intelligible, and it is in fact an exhaustive set of criteria. You don't know that. I don't even know how you could demonstrate that. Are you omniscient? <laughs> no, definitely not. And so now all you can say is we've identified, all you can say is let's say we've identified these three things and they are definitely required for the universe to be intelligible, but you cannot say whether or not that excludes some other criteria that you aren't aware of as well, like perhaps a God. I'll tell you, this strikes me as being uh, the type of topic that could be very interesting for people to dive into in the Facebook group. Um, so this is what I think you ought to do. Uh, take your argument, write it out, go join the Facebook group and, and present it. And people will kick it around. People will you know, tell you you're brilliant, tell you you're, you're ridiculous and everything in between. Um, and it'll give you an opportunity to, uh, to workshop this. Thank you very much. Thank you for considering it. Yeah. Have, yeah thanks. Nice evening. Have, guys. have a good one. Yeah. All right. We don't have any passwords calling in yet. And I'm really, really disappointed about this. Well, you do have a theist. <laughs> We do have one theist. Um, let's dive in. We've got we've got repeat caller Kevin in New York calling in. Uh, would like to ask whether or not anyone has proposed the concept of the Ark of the Covenant. Wow, uh, I don't even know what that means. I am familiar with Indiana Jones. Um, so the concept of the Ark <laughs> of the Covenant is, <laughs> I've thought about it. Uh, so, Kevin. <laughs> what, what do you mean by the, the, the concept of the Ark of the Covenant, Kevin? I'm sorry, <clears throat> uh, not the concept of the Ark of the Covenant, but uh, the content of the Ark of the Covenant. Oh, the content um, of the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, what about it? Yeah. Um, uh, before I, I dive right into it, um, I, I really want to stress the point that it's important to throw out any uh, theological framework that, that's been built up thus far. It doesn't matter which denomination that we're talking about because whatever one you bring up uh, has barriers in which uh, they're afraid to step out of the boundaries of. Well, it, it kind of does matter. Well, but So when you talk about the content of the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant is specifically yeah. something that's in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, or the Christian Old Testament. Um, and I, I'm not aware, so first of all, what are the contents of the Ark of the Covenant and how can you know that? Well, uh, the contents of the Ark of the Covenant, it has been written about and there's only three items in the Ark of the Covenant. Kevin, Kevin, but I, I'm, yes. I'm asking what the contents are and how you know that. The contents are uh, the broken tables of the law, which Moses had, uh, the staff of Aaron, the brother of Moses, and the jar of manna that the people had collected when they were out in the desert sure. as their only source of. Sure. Um, so, got it. So, so those are the contents. How do you know those are the contents? Where are they? Can we investigate this? Um, yes, yes, we can investigate it because, uh, my argument is, is that these, these three things are, uh, in my opinion, uh, God to, uh, enduring to prove that he exists in a threefold aspect. Kevin? Now, I'm asking how we can investigate the actual contents of the Ark. Do we have the Ark? Do we know where the Ark is? How would we find out what's actually in the Ark? Yeah, because until you can demonstrate that or provide some explanation for how we can you know, actually do the work here, we might as well be talking about the contents of Darth Vader's nightstand. You right, know, because even if you even if pre presented a box made of shit and wood and inside was a broken tablet, a piece of wood, and a jar with something in it, that still doesn't mean that it's the tablets that Moses had. It doesn't mean it's the staff of Aaron. It doesn't mean that it's a jar of manna. And yet 
I'm asking you how we can investigate this. And your response was to say, yes, we can investigate this because this is God attempting to prove something. That is not a method of investigation. What method can we use to investigate the contents of the Ark of the Covenant? Um, in my opinion, um, it's not something that everybody can go and investigate because... Oh, stop, Kevin. Part of <laughs> Kevin, Kevin. I, I, I'm, I'm not that concerned. I know you, a couple times now you started with, in my opinion. But when you say, in your opinion, it's not something that just anybody can go investigate. Is there anybody on the planet who can investigate this? Who is it and how can they investigate it? Other than Indiana Jones. Well, it's the very fact that some of what I'm about to tell you has only been recently released. Say, no, just, just answer the question, man. Just, just answer the question. Without, without the preamble, just, 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 just tell us. Who can investigate the Ark of the Covenant and how can we know that? Uh, anybody who has access to uh, Jerusalem libraries. To Jerusalem libraries? Is it in multiple yeah. libraries? Oh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, not Jerusalem libraries, but uh, Vatican libraries. I'm sorry. Vatican libraries. Vatican do, do you have access to these, Kevin? Have you investigated the Ark? No. Then I'm not interested in anything else you have uh, to say. Yeah, and, and how would we know if anybody else did? I mean, you, you're saying, you you alluded earlier to how you think that the contents of the Ark point to some greater truth about who God is. Um, but as far as we can tell, it's just a story. Um, I mean, the, uh, without getting into the whole thing about the Exodus being a, 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 a fable, I mean, it's, it's a myth. Um, the It'd be like if someone was talking about the contents of Darth Vader's nightstand and being like, well, by looking at that, there's a picture of Amidala in there and, uh, you know, Obi-Wan's bracelet. And it tells us something about who Darth Vader is. I mean, it's a story. I mean, sure, the storyteller could be trying to tell us something about the character of Darth Vader, but it's a story. So well, how do we go well, yeah, from... I, I mean, I understand what you guys are saying. It's just that... Um, I don't believe you do. I'm really coming from the point of view that that early church fathers and you know the the scripture such as the Bible, you know, it really shows signs of intellectual laziness because early church fathers, uh, not only back then but now recently, uh, they were incorrect in their compilation of what is available. But, but you know, what does any of this have to do with whether or not there was an ark or, or what we could possibly know about what's in it? If, if we can't get there, then this this calls, you know, sort of dead in the water. Yeah. I, I mean, if you're going to talk about intellectual laziness, I, mean, I have my own thoughts about that. Well, well, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, because most of the theists that call you. No, I'm talking about you. You know, as. Well, well, yes. Um, that, that's that's the thing on which I, I'm trying to bring an argument that you might not have heard of because well, you don't have an argument, Kevin. You don't have an argument. You don't have evidence. You are just making claims. And I've asked you, and you you're you're like, oh, there's some, some people can anybody who has access to the Vatican Library can look this stuff up, but you don't know that because you don't have access to that either. I'm I'm fairly confident that when I don't give a shit how confident you are, I want evidence. Yeah, and, and what you're going to find in the Vatican Library is going to be more more writing about the source material, but the source material is just a story. Yeah. It's really important to know that when this argument is even talked about, most people are only bringing up at least two thirds of the the argument that should be presented. All right, Kevin, I'm gonna, I'm you have you, not presented any argument at all. I'm going I'm to give you exactly one chance to make an argument, um, to present an argument. Okay. And if, if it, it doesn't come spilling out of you, we're going to move on to another caller. Uh, so go ahead, make your argument. Go. The argument is that the Bible is incomplete without the Apocrypha, which is the third step. And... It's not just the Ark of the Covenant, but other things are proving that God has tried to prove to us that he exists in a threefold aspect. And so the Bible is incomplete without the Apocrypha. 
Okay, so there's an assertion that the there's an assertion that the there's the the apocrypha here. Okay, this isn't an 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 argument. So what I want you to do, Kevin, is to to back up and regroup. Um, I want you to, I mean, just just get on like Wikipedia and look at argument and look at how to structure an argument to go from premises to a conclusion. And when you when you feel like you've got that call us back. Um, but in the meantime, we're going to have to move on to, to other callers. Um, the, yeah, the, the, you're, you're going to do some more foundational stuff before trying to present, uh, something because what you have is not an argument yet, my friend. So, uh, we're going to move on. Um, we've got some atheists on the, on the, in the queue here. We've got one more theist. Let's take one more atheist here. Uh, we've got Joe in Canada. Uh, wanting to talk about how using labels like I'm I, okay. Listen, I think you mean atheist, but whoever typed this in wrote labels like ashiest is sometimes the end of meaningful discussion. <laughs> so now I'm thinking about somebody who just doesn't like know about lotion. <laughs> you don't look particularly healthy, man. You're yeah, looking just... rather ashen today. <laughs> so, but I think you mean atheist. Am I am I right, or did you want to talk about ashy people? Well, well, I don't the. What the label is wasn't really as relevant to the conversation. I think it's relevant here, obviously, because of the show. But um, I wanted to talk to you guys about it because it's such a massive part of what you do. And I imagine a massive part of your life uh, living in a community that are mostly religious and being an atheist. But I just noticed that if I'm talking with somebody new that I don't know that well, as soon as they start to figure out certain attributes of, of how I'm thinking about things, they'll as quickly as possible try to slap a label on that, whether it's liberal or atheist. And then the conversation seems to shut down in their mind. Now they know how I think about every part of every conversation. And I wondered, I was sort of asking for advice on um, if you run into that and what some techniques might be, be to sort of pry that open and, and I guess, you know, um, take away the damage that those labels do to a conversation. I don't know if you have any advice. I mean, I don't think it's the label's fault if people are jumping to conclusions about you. I mean, if you if you say you're an atheist, I mean, yeah. that 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 shouldn't tell the, them anything about you other than that you're not convinced there's a god. Any any other shit that they pile on you as a result of that, oh well, then therefore you can't have morality or whatever. That's that's their that's their problem, not the the label's problem. It's a failure of critical thinking uh, more than anything else. Yeah, it's it's irrelevant. But I want to say this: you sound an awful lot like Tim mentioned. Not exactly, but something about the particular mannerisms and the way you were phrasing something. I just, I have Tim's voice in my head now, along with yours. Um, well, the labels, I have a really good uh, accent because I'm an Aussie expat that lives in Canada for like 11 years now. So it's a weird hybrid thing going. Uh, uh, that makes, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so yes, I agree that labels can get in the way, but I, I agree with Kenneth. I think what you're talking about, what we're always talking about when we get to this is that um, people are lazy. People want to put people in a bucket. And so if I can say, oh, you're a liberal, oh, you're an atheist, oh, you're a secularist, oh, you're a humanist, oh, you're, you know, whatever, um, then that's a way for them to stop thinking. You are correct. But yeah, I don't know how you avoid uh, that problem. I don't know how you fix that. Because if you stop using the label, then all you're going to have to do is have a conversation about that's going to lead them to the label. It's like people yeah. were like, oh, I think the atheist label has too much baggage. So let's start calling ourselves brights. Well, bright has a bunch of baggage. And and when you have a talk with somebody and you're like, oh, I'm a bright. And they say, what's that mean? And you're like, oh, it's, you know, essentially it's somebody who doesn't believe in God. And then they say, oh, you mean like an atheist? Well, now you've wasted a bunch of time to get to a label they know. Yeah. I'd much rather say, uh, you know, it, you can't stop somebody from assuming they know everything about you. Uh, I like to try to confound expectations by saying something that perhaps they weren't expecting, but I, don't. I mean, it, it yeah. can function as a great litmus test. If you tell somebody, you know, that you're an atheist and then they jump to, Oh, so you fill in the blank. Um, it, I mean, it tells you <laughs> quite a bit about, about them more than they think they know about you. I would, I would argue um, at that point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm in agreement uh, with Matt I, on this one. I fully agree with all that. I, I don't think it's a valid way of going 
of, of that they're behaving. It's more so how do we resurrect the conversation after that happens? I, I just wondered if you had just ask a question techniques yeah. that you might use, you know, so well, ask a question. And one of the things is that like, if you, if you say, Oh, I'm an atheist and you see that there seems to be some sort of like, mental like i love watching people think and so when somebody does the let's see atheist oh this means that this means this this this. you could always say by the way just for clarity what does that mean to you when i say that and then you can have a discussion about what the label means and what it doesn't mean yeah yeah you know you can say sometimes sometimes when i tell people i'm an atheist they think this uh when that's not really the case and i I just want to make sure you're not confused yeah, that's a. I think that's a good way to go about it. I think there's a certain level of hostility that you can't get past, but I was just sort of looking um, for, for yeah, I think that's a good idea. And I only really just got exposed to Anthony Magnabosco, so I think I should try and delve into the street epistemology thing and see. I'm sure there's plenty of techniques there that would yeah, help. Yeah, definitely. There's a, there's a lot to learn there. A ton. Uh, yeah, yeah, Anthony, that's so much good content. It's, it's really uh, incredible. And he's a genuinely nice guy in, in my experience, so... Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it all just stems from a personal experience recently where a person actually had to remove themselves from this social gathering because they were going to physically harm me because I had made a comment that labeled me as a liberal and then they knew everything about me after that and uh, it caused that much anger. So, yeah, I was um, – anyway, I, that, that's sort of what prompted it. And I, 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 was, I know labels are so useful, so it's hard to do without them, but I, I wondered if there's a way we could talk um, that didn't – lead to labeling immediately but i guess it, it they're just too useful to give up i suppose but i yeah my my immediate thought is when you, if you said you're in some social gathering and you and someone finds out you're a liberal and they want to you know physically assault you this has been a very useful term because you've identified the asshole in the room so it's like <laughs> yeah. You know I mean? yeah but yeah hopefully this has been yeah. helpful um it has i cool. have and i'm Love to the crew and the call screeners because I didn't realize how hard they're working. It's my first time calling and they have to spend so much time checking in on the callers. And uh, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a huge thing. And these shows are awesome and we need them. And so, yeah, I'm grateful to those people. They've activated the, the Lovering Cannon at you right now for, okay. for acknowledging that they exist. Um, let's further acknowledge them. Can we get the crew cam up and thank these wonderful people who, who make Yay. the show happen? Um, there we go. We got the crew cat. What a, what a wonderful group of people. I mean, and, and listen, we're, the, the hosts are always saying this because it's it's freaking true. Um, there There is no show. There is no ACA without those people. Um, I mean, it's the, the hosts. We do nothing. Um, so anyway, uh, we're going to move on. We got another another theist here. Um, thanks for calling in, Joe. Uh, we've got Billy in Texas who wants to talk about the need to prove God does not exist. I'm not sure I understand. Billy, what can we do for you? Hey, how are you doing? Um Good. Uh, so, so I was thinking. I just want to run a, a quick argument by by you guys. Um, you guys are not convinced that a god exists, right? Or are you correct? Not convinced that a god. That, are you also con, not convinced that a god could ever, ever potentially exist? Correct. I, I would need to hear. I, I've I've actually never heard like a, a coherent definition of god that that makes sense to me in a way that it could exist. Uh, so I. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was uh, I was looking at uh, you know Brian Cox, right? The, yes, uh, physicist. Um, his right, right. His book, um, Quantum Universe. Um, uh, it states that everything that can happen does happen. Um, so if uh, does that also would you also say that uh, if uh, if a god could happen, then a god would happen, or or a god did happen, is happening, or would happen in the future? Um, was that is that something that is? Um... I always get weird when when people talk about like the stuff that physicists say because in my experience, when talking to actual physicists, when they make statements like that, they are very narrowly speaking about physics stuff, and everything is within the, within the context of of physics. So I I don't know if what you're saying, this other individual said, applies in some other sense you know what i mean well well well, his his exact um quote is everything that can happen does happen and so i uh, i kind of thought about uh well if if um you know if a god can happen then a god would happen right and so wouldn't that wouldn't that uh cause us to have to um kind of indicate that a god can't happen in order to to say that it it that that, uh, otherwise it's no it can't can't happen no then it won't happen. Okay. No, 
Okay. So, so here's the thing. First okay. of all, when, when somebody like Brian Cox is saying that everything can happen, does happen, doesn't mean that everything that can happen does happen within this particular, uh, within our, the local presentation of our universe. He's talking about things in, in quantum terms and in potential multiverse terms. However, um, I, I think I can beat this really easily. Uh, Billy, I'm presuming you think it's possible for a God to exist, right? Um, I don't discount that. Well, you're a theist, it says here. So not only do you think it's possible, yeah, you think yeah. there is a God, right? Um, yeah, to a certain okay. extent, yes. Sure. So I'm not convinced that it's possible for a God to exist. So even under Brian Cox's everything that can happen does happen, I'm not convinced. You would need possibility needs to be demonstrated. It's not the case that everything is possible until it's been proven impossible. Things are either possible or impossible. And what needs to be demonstrated is whether they fall into the bucket of things that are possible or whether they fall into the bucket of things that are impossible. But if you believe that the God is possible and you want to go down Brian's route of everything that can happen does happen, then yes, you are on, on, you know, assuming you're looking at it the way, you know, within the scope of the universe, yes, a God would exist. Do you think it's possible for a God to exist and to tell me that, that he exists? I don't. I don't know. I don't know if. Um. I. I think that if if life is really to be a challenge, then that would. Ex Wait. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. It's supposed to. Hey, no. 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 Because I. I. I came up with a knockdown thing here, Billy, and I don't find your answer to be particularly honest. You think that it's possible for a god to exist, but you're not convinced that it's possible for a god to tell me it exists. I just said I don't know. I, said I, don't. I, I don't find that. I, I just. Why? Do, I, I genuinely don't find that to be honest. What what God do what God do you think could possibly exist? And you're not convinced that it could tell me it exists. I, I was trying to explain if if life is supposed to be a challenge, then that would explain why God doesn't powder our ass for us. I didn't ask about God <laughs> powdering an ass. I asked whether or not a God was capable of telling me it exists. I have no idea. I don't know. Do you think it's possible? Uh, I don't think it's impossible. This is, this is, I, I'm done. I, I, I'm completely fucking done because I came down with an, not only did I explain the problem with Brian Cox's thing, it doesn't apply within this universe. Uh, everything that, it, that can happen doesn't necessarily happen within our local presentation of the universe. But now we're talking about possibility and impossibility. And you think a God's possible. But when I get to the knockdown thing that would, ex that would expose the problem with your argument, now all of a sudden you're like, well, I don't think it's impossible. It's, I'm, I'm done with this fuzzy bullshit. Believe what whatever you want. I'm done with it, Billy. I, it's always very confusing to me when theists call in and aren't very specific and clear about what they believe. Um, maybe it's just the, 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 the church that I grew up in, but there was this idea that you're supposed to be sort of just like unapologetically out there with, with what you believe. Uh, so maybe we just come from different religious traditions, but um, like uh, you believe there's a God that's real. Like I didn't call in to talk about any of that stuff. I called to talk in once about one specific thing, and then he took, and then Matt turned it into some other thing, and now and now. No, sir. I'm so no, sorry. sir, Billy. I did not turn it into another thing. I specifically addressed your issue. Yeah, yeah. You addressed my issue, and then you were talking about like whether or not it could talk to you, whether or not I believe that a god could talk to you. That, that, that's not the reason I called you. You answered my question. Then I, go the fuck away, Billy, because that's the response <laughs> to your argument. Fuck you, dude. I'm, Billy, fuck you, dude. Billy, good you job, believe, Billy. Oh, Jesus Christ. I. Why? 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 Why spend your time like that, Billy? I. 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 I, I will never understand this. Um. I just, I just don't get I, it. I sit here. So, so here's the thing. I'm going to finish this even if Billy's not here. Go for it. Billy's argument is essentially because Brian Cox says, which is an argument from authority, which is a fallacy. That's the theme for today. That's today's yeah. <laughs> theme. Of because the show. Brian Cox says anything that's possible happens because he thinks that God is possible. Therefore, God exists. And then the, the follow up question is okay, you know, what, what do you think this God's characteristics are? So is it possible for that God to exist and to tell me that it exists? Well, I don't know. Well, I don't know. The answer to that is yes. There is not a God 
that you think is possible that couldn't also have the capability to tell me it exists. And when, and the fact that that hasn't happened, the fact that there isn't a God who has told me that it exists means that that God isn't possible. It's called a reductio ad absurdum. When you assume something for the sake of demonstrating that it leads to an absurdity. So I assumed Billy's argument. I assumed Billy's argument that anything that is possible must happen. Then I presented something that should be possible under Billy's model and has not happened. And the fact that it has not happened, a reductio ad absurdum, we have reduced Billy's argument to absurdity to demonstrate that Billy's argument is not in fact sound. Yeah. That is the method by which we go through and analyze arguments and evidence. I'm sorry that for Billy, it was a crippling uh, imposition to actually address the question honestly. Yeah. I was going to go with, is it possible that I'm going to date Nicki Minaj? Uh, does that mean it's going to happen? <laughs> Evidently <laughs> you know? not. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll keep hoping. Um, not, not yet anyway. <laughs> not in this universe anyway. Um, we've got one more caller uh, that I want to get to really fast because I've been waiting for such a long time. And I think it's going to be a pretty quick, uh, pretty quick answer here before we got to sign off. Uh, so EJ in, in Georgia wanted to ask, what's our take on the councils of Ephesus and Nicaea and how <laughs> they shaped the Bible? Um, is that, is that the question? That is the question. And I just want to listen to your response. Uh, that's, that's a big question. Um, so I don't think it shaped the Bible. I don't think either of them shaped the Bible. Um, we had Athanasius basically put out with his Easter encyclical, which books were going to be part of the canonical Bible. So it didn't change the formulation of the canon. But like Nicaea is where they ultimately wound up talking about the Trinity and other things, doctrinal things, where the Arians were talking about the nature of God the Father and God the Son, etc. cetera. Um, Ephesus, I mean, this was about establishing church doctrine. And I will say that while a lot of what they discussed, you know, still hangs out, the truth is that you know, while Nicaea was what, 325, and I think Ephesus was 400 and something. Um, yeah, a little bit later. Yeah. Like, I, yeah, I don't remember the exact date. I remember the 325 because I actually wrote a song um, specifically about the Council of Nicaea, or I rewrote a pop song with lyrics specifically about the Council of Nicaea. And so 325 AD or CE was in there. But <laughs> well, I, yeah, it's it was a weird thing for a lecture that I gave. All right. Um, but I don't know that it makes a lot of difference because the truth is with all the different um, Christian denominations, they have all changed since 325. They've all changed since for whatever teen thing it was. Um, and what modern Christians tend to think is very different than it was 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 500 years ago. Um, so while I find it interesting from an, uh, an historical perspective, and like, I think the Trinity was invented at Nicaea in 325. I don't think that there's good reason to think that it existed in any sense in, in, in much, much more than a loose concept prior to that. Um, I don't know that much else significantly impacted, yeah. certainly not the Bible because the canon existed, but uh, I don't think there was much left doctrine wise. Okay. I have one, just one other question. Do you believe that the philosophers of years ago are basically Hollywood wordsmiths of their time? Are, are basically what? They're like Hollywood wordsmiths of their time, philosophers. I think it, de it depends on the philosopher you're talking about and when, you know, what their aims and goals were. Um, I, I know. I mean, Matt's way more educated on this than I. I don't am, know what Hollywood wordsmiths means. I think he's asking if 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 they're basically know, just, just, you know, I think that the term a lot of people would use would be like you know like mental masturbation. If they're just if they're just armchair hypothesizing about stuff. No, no, no. Than, I, I I think so. Philosophy was incredibly important. I, it's the foundation of epistemology. You don't get to the sciences without it. You don't get to any modern understanding of anything without the foundation of the sciences. But. Uh, so I, if, if, you're, if you mean Hollywood wordsmiths in the sense that it's just pablum and sophistry, then no, I absolutely don't think that. But if you mean that it's kind of like uh, these were the big ideas 
presented to people uh, in, in a somewhat approachable way. I'm not sure that's true either because philosophy is something that a lot of people just don't get in and ignore. Um, I, right. But I'm a little biased because I, I like a little philosophy. Yeah. Well, and I think like <laughs> this, the, the parts of philosophy that I've read most and, and know about would be, you know, ancient Greek stuff. I, modern philosophy, I'm, I'm still doing a lot of work there. But yeah, I think that, you know, there, there are distinctions between folks like sophists and, you know, someone like Aristotle, who's trying to figure out, you know, how to logic, right? So, I mean, there's, there's right. a difference between someone who would refer to themselves as a philosopher, who is just sort of trying to figure out how to, you know, essentially play games with words, uh, and someone who is trying to sharpen the mind. Um, and gain a greater understanding of the world. If that's if that's even answering your question. Uh... In a way, yes. In a way, yes. Um, again, I'm, I'm still stuck on them being wordsmiths because what you said kind of puts me in that direction. Well, I, th I mean, I, I don't know. I, I'm going to pick on theologists right now because I, I tend to think of theology as like a pseudoscience. I don't I don't really recognize it as like le legitimate philosophy. And I know that's that's going to frustrate and upset some people. But um, I think that sort of thinking deeply on a question like how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, you know, is 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 kind of a waste of time. But I would point to other branches of philosophy, other philosophers and say that I find them extremely useful. And I think that humanity is better off because of the work that they've done. So but yeah, I would say not everything that gets labeled philosophy is particularly useful, but there are a few things that we find useful that don't have a foundation in some aspect of philosophy. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. With that, we are, we are running out of time, EJ. So I hope that this was, was helpful. It was. Thank you very much. You guys right. take care. Have a good one. Um, with that, I want to reiterate that uh, there are ways that you can support the show and support the ACA. Uh, you can become a member, like we talked about earlier, by clicking that join button below the video. Um, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash talk heathen to me. Uh, be sure to check us out, the, the podcast, if you prefer to consume our content in that way. You don't want to look at us. I, I get it. Uh, Tiny.cc slash AEN podcasts is the place to do that. Um, if you want to go dig into the, what was his name? The, the guy from Romania, who's going to go on the Facebook group and talk to us about disproving God. That'll be on the Facebook group at facebook.com. I think that was it. Yeah. Uh, uh, facebook.com slash group slash talk heathen FG. Uh, if you want to come hang out in the discord in a few minutes, I'll be over there, um, at the, uh, the ACA discord, um, nonprofits is coming up after us. Can we get the crew cam up one more time? I just love these people and I just wanted to thank them again and draw attention to these wonderful people who make the show happen. Um, Matt, do you have any final thoughts? I mean, it's like the, it's like, like, like Jerry Springer. Like am I, am I going to die in a minute? <laughs> hey, can you get your final thought in before we execute you? Uh, no, no, I just, I, I'm, I'm really good to be here. And I will say that, you know, okay. Uh, one call, you know, kind of ends in frustration. My, my source of frustration is always twofold. Um, if we ask a question, there's a reason behind it. If you think we're trying to trap you, um, tough. Because if 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 you're if you if you have the truth, there's no trap. The truth has nothing to fear from inquiry. If I ask you, how do you know that? That's not a trap. If I say, hey, do you think this is possible? It, like, let your guard down just a smidgen, and all of the conversations will go much better. Because. I'm not sitting here going, oh, I can't wait to pummel some theist. It's, I, I spent time thinking about it, philosophizing, one might say, and come up with a thing and all of a sudden it's like, well, fuck you. Well, fuck you too. Well, I, nobody wants that. That's not why I wanted to be here. Yeah. And I'm not happy or proud that it happens. And the people who write it like, oh, can't you be nice to the callers? Yeah, yeah, yeah we can. And, and people do do it differently. Um, but the, the importance of the conversations that take place here at Talk Heathen, Atheist Experience, Truth Wanted, uh, Secular Sexuality, and uh, Nonprofits, I, 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 think, I don't think the importance can really be overstated because at the end of the day, there are people who are searching for answers and some of them don't have the tools to figure out whether or not they are even in a pursuit that is likely to bear fruit. And maybe those people who don't have a clue are me and Kenneth. Yeah. And it would be really good if someone could come in 
and actually explain how and why we don't have a clue. And yet what we get are fallacies, flawed arguments, um, bizarre appeals to, oh, if space is expanding, it must be expanding and something's being created, which means there's a creator and that means God, ta-da. Um, there's, a, there's a lot more questions out there. And I, I, I won't be on Talk Ethan all the time, but I love coming over on occasion. I look forward to, to hanging out with you on this show and other shows again. So thanks for well, having we, me. Yeah. Well, and, and with what you said, I mean, yeah, we've, we've both been wrong before. We know what that feels like. And, and to have our minds changed by, been wrong today. by evidence. <laughs> well, maybe. Uh, not me. I've been, I'm on a hot streak with not being that's, wrong so far. That's so. fair. That's not true. I fucked up the, uh, the appeal to authority thing earlier. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> uh, really quickly, I want to get the love rings going and, and to thank our viewers. Um, whether or not you believe if you're an essential worker, we want to thank you. Um, my very best friend in the world, who's going to be the best man at my wedding in two months, is, a, is an essential uh, worker. He's a, he's, a, he's a flight nurse and was talking to me this morning about how devastating uh, this Delta variant is and, and the work that's being done out there. Uh, healthcare workers, thank you for everything that you do. Um, if you are out there and you are not getting vaccinated and you're not wearing a mask and you're not doing the really basic and simple shit that, uh, you know, would, would help get all this stuff over with so we can get back to, to normal life. Um, stop it. Uh, you're being a shitty person. You're the reason <laughs> so, we can't have nice things. You're the yeah. reason that Austin has gone back to stage four and now stage five. We are pretty close to lockdown yeah. again, quadrupling. Like, I, like, I, I love you, but, but like, stop uh, just be, be a decent human being and do the right thing. Um, anyway, off my soapbox, if you don't believe this is your community, uh, we appreciate you being here. We hope that you engage with us. We hope we see you in the Facebook group. Um, if you do believe we don't hate you, we're just not convinced.